I guess we can get started. People will probably trickle in the next few minutes or so. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to sort of see where you're at. How many people have used migrations before? A few of you? OK. If any of you want to come up here and talk with me, you're welcome to. Uh, have any of you used Flyway before? No? I don't think so. Well, that's good. At least I know something more than other people in this room. Um, have, how many people have heard of migrations before? OK. Half-ish or so? That's good. That's good. OK. Um, so anyway, uh, my name is Jeremy Smith. This talk is about managing your schema. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear OK? OK. Um, and it, it's a talk about using migrations. Um, so first of all, a little bit about me. I'm a um, senior software engineer. I'm sort of. I'm about equal parts developer and DBA, although my title and my lanyard both say software engineer. So I guess I'm at least 51% software engineer. Um, my background is actually in geoscience, so I used to travel around the world and put instruments in, in remote places and, and do all kinds of fun stuff like that. Now I work from home and don't get out too much anymore. Um, I've used migrations for about seven years. Um, and there's my contact information if you need to contact me. And these slides will be up on the, on the schedule later. Um, so don't feel like you need to write everything down. Uh, I work for a company called UNAVGO, which is um, it's mostly funded by the uh, National Science Foundation and NASA. It's a nonprofit it's a consortium of, of mostly universities and some institutions. And our goal is to facilitate geoscience research, research and education. Some of those words are a little bit loaded. But what, it, what it basically means is that we don't really do a lot of research ourselves, um, but we facilitate other people doing research in geoscience. Um, and one way we do that is um, by installing and maintaining and archiving data for um, large networks of, of um, geodetic instruments. In this case, this is a high-precision GPS monument that we have. We have a couple thousand of these around the West Coast in Alaska. Um, uh, we've used Postgres for about 10 years. And uh, we, we store all kinds of stuff, lots of, lots of um, time, some time series data in there, and then just um, lots of stuff about our instruments. We need to know in a lot of detail about where our instruments are and what, what exactly is at each site and stuff like that. Um, you know, our, our primary database is about 500 tables, about 500 gigabytes, which I'm sure it's a lot smaller than a lot of people have, but um, probably bigger than some, and a lot of tables, probably. Probably a lot more tables than some people are used to. Um, this graphic is just um, from our G high precision GPS um, instruments, which get precision about um, less than sub-millimeter precision. Um, you can figure out um, plate tectonic motion. That's one of the things we, we, we do. Um, that's one of our primary things is figuring out how the plates are moving around. So this is how the sort of the west coast of the U.S. is is moving around. Um, so a little outline of my talk today. First, uh, why we should use migrations, and then a bit of an introduction to Flyway in particular, which is a particular migration tool, um, and then how to use it, and then some tips about writing effective migrations. And if there's time at the end, I'd like to talk about integrating it with with Jenkins, which is an um, automatic build tool. So first, a little bit about the problem. Um, so I'm, this is sort of a typical um, scenario in a, in a place that develops software. So you have your developers up there, those three guys, um, and they each have their own development database, probably on their laptop or you know, maybe on some other box or something like that, which is probably a, a scaled down version of what's in production, what, much less data or something like that. They're, they're all developing software. They might be developing the same thing, might be developing something different. Um, but their soft, in order to um, implement their software, they'll need to make changes to their, their database. Um, and somehow, those changes need to get into the continuous integration database, and then out to the test database, and then into the production databases eventually. And um, there's also the problem of, of the hot fixes. You know, so you know, the DBA decides oh, there's some problem in the production database that we need to fix. And so how does that fix trickle back up the system, back into the development boxes? Um, so how do we keep the databases in sync with each other? You know, even if we're talking about, we all sort of talking about the same database, but we all, we all have you know, our development version, our test version, and things like that. Um, how do we synchronize the software releases with these database changes? Um, and how do we figure out what changes have been applied to each of these different databases? You know, we need to figure out if has that hotfix been applied to our local development database or something like that. Um, and then um, another sort of related point is how do we create a new development or test database? 
you know, you get a new developer on board, he or she needs a, a laptop, and he or she needs a, a, a box with, with, a, with a database on it. I should say, feel free to ask questions whenever this stuff is sort of background stuff, but feel free to ask questions. Um, so I, I think a good answer to this is migrations, which are simply um, version changes to your schema. Um, so every change you put in has, this, has a particular version. And I put up a really simple thing here. So version one um, of your database, you might, um, to get to version one, you'd create a table called users. In version two, you would alter that table somehow. In version three, you could add an index on it. Version four, um, create another table or something like that. So each of these changes has a particular um, version associated with it. And what that does, that versioning, gives you um, some cool things. It gives you, that version will be stored somewhere in the database. All the migration tools do that somehow. Um, and you can see the current version. And when you can see the current version, you know exactly what, what's been applied to your database. Um, and it also gives you a clear upgrade path forward. Um, so if you're, at, if you're at an empty database, you know exactly how to get to version four. If you're at version two, you know exactly how to get to version three or version four. Um, and migrations are, are simply little bits of code that should be kept in version control. Um, and when you can keep your, your, your database changes in version control, it gives you lots of cool things. You, know, you can go back and you can figure out who to blame when something breaks, or you can, uh, um, you can easily share your changes with the other developers on your team and the, and the DBAs. And it also gives you um, integration with your building and your testing tools. So when you check something in, you can have your build tools automatically build stuff for you. Uh, so the, the particular um, migration tool that I like, um, I've, used, I've used migration tools for about seven years. And at first, we sort of rolled our own. Um, and there, there are a few others. Uh, there's a, a Ruby has one that's really popular. I think it's called Active Record Migration, something like that. Um, SQL Alchemy with Python has one, too. I forget. That one has some name, which I forget. Um, but I, I happen to like Flyway. And overall, these tools are fairly simple overall. Um, the, the concept isn't, isn't, isn't groundbreaking, but it's, it's, uh, they're, they're useful tools. Um, so Flyway is a particular migration tool. It's open source. It's about five years old now. Um, it's cross-platform. It'll work on you know, Windows, uh, Macs, and Linux, and stuff like that. Um, it's written in Java. But you don't need to you don't need to know Java at all to use it. Uh, you can use Java if you want to. So it has a bunch of different interfaces to this tool. Um, the command line one, which is the one I'll talk about mostly here, um, is simply you just type on the command line, and it does your migrations for you. And, and there are some other little tools it does. But you can also plug into a Java API, or if you're building already with something like Gradle or Ant or Maven, you can um, you can interface straight to Flyway with that, so that your build is sort of all, all together if you're, if you're already using those tools. Um, it supports Postgres and a bunch of other databases, too. I didn't list them all there, but pretty much all the popular databases it'll, it'll support. Uh, so the command line part of Flyway, um, this is for users who don't use the JVM or don't want to use the build tools like Gradle or Maven or Ant. Um, it, it can come with a <coughs> JRE, the Java runtime environment. It can come with that, um, or you can uh, use the system Java. Uh, it's the, the one that's bundled with the JRE is nice. Um, if you're all in one platform, you can just check the whole thing in the subversion and, and just use that. Uh, if, you're, if you're not, like I, you know, my development box is a Mac, and then I check into a Linux server. Um, our builds are on the Linux server. So I just check in the Flyway stuff. use the system Java. It's not that particular about stuff, but it comes with all the libraries it needs. Uh, to run. So I just check in the, the, the bit of Flyway stuff there. Um, and it, there's the link to where you can get it from. Uh, when you get it, this is the, the basic directory structure of, of Flyway. It's not too complicated. Um, basically, there's the lib folder, which just has the, the Java libraries. You don't really ever, ever have to look in there. Um, configuration, which has a configuration file. Um, I'll go into that a little bit more. Um, Drivers, it comes with JDBC drivers for a number of databases, including Postgres already. Um, and then you'll put your migrations in either the jars or the SQL folder. I'll go into that a little bit more 
Um, Jerry is there if you download the Java runtime environment. And then these are the actual executables, uh, flyaway.command for Windows or just flyaway for everything else. It's just a shell script, which calls the, the, the Java, um, it, it'll call the Java program that's in there somewhere. So Flyway itself is very configurable, but it has really good defaults. So in practice, you don't need to configure it too much. Um, the main thing you need to configure is the connection parameter. So you need to give it the, the JDBC URL. And it has examples inside the configuration file to help you um, figure that out. So you know it'll be like JDBC going slash slash, and then the, the path, the host name and things in the database. Um, you can set all of, the, all of the configuration parameters in both the configuration file um, or the command line. Everything set in the command line will override anything set in the configuration file. So that's useful if, if um, say, I mean, there, there are a number of ways to do this, but if you want to uh, just leave it as localhost in your configuration file, you could, you could um, run your migrations there as a the localhost. And if you want to do production, you could just, um, over in, the UR, in the command line parameters, you could change it to connect to production there. Uh, so to actually create migrations in Flyway, um, it's really, really simple. Basically, there's one file per, mi per migration. The migrations can be either just plain SQL, just a file with SQL in it, um, or you can write a Java migration. Um, and the Java migrations tend to be for, if you're doing really advanced data changes, something that would be really hard to calculate in SQL. Um, but you use SQL migrations for everything else. In practice, I've, uh, in seven years, I've never, well, in five years since I've been using Flyway, I've never used the Java um, migration. I just haven't, haven't had a need to. Um, and there's no special languages or XML. A lot of those other uh, migration tools require, or don't necessarily require, but sort of um, emphasize their own language for, for, um, for, doing, for creating tables and things like that. I mean, one of those packaged with Ruby on Rails, which has its own special thing, and the other one's packaged with SQL Alchemy, which has its own way of creating tables and things like that. So this is just for people who just want to write plain SQL, um, just, in, just in plain files. Um, in order to get Flyway to understand which, how to order your migrations, you need to, um, the way it does it is through the file name, basically. And you, uh, you name your file in a, in a special way to do this. So the, this starts with a V for, for version. And then there's some number of numbers, and, um, and then the, which makes the version. So in this case, it's version 002.00. Uh, dot zero zero that, so you can, you can break up the version into multiple parts, as many parts as you want to. And then there are two underscores. There's actually two underscores there between the zero zero <coughs> and the, the word fix. And everything after that is a description of that uh, migration. And you can put, you can do underscores there between the words, or you can do spaces. I just like underscores better. Um, and then the, the suffix, which is by default the SQL. Um, so, so basically, that, that's how it figures out the order to do it. So it'll, it'll parse that version number at the beginning. And so you can have version 002.00.002.01, and so on. Uh, so my recommendations for versioning, I, uh, I like, you can put as many 00 as you want. And the examples, if you go to the Flyway documentation, they'll, they won't put any zeros at the beginning. I like to put some zeros there just when you're looking at your directory of, of migrations so they're, they're sorted in order, they're lexically, lexically ordered. Um, and I like to break it up, I like to put um, sort of minor versions in there too so it, it helps you break apart larger migrations or just add in smaller things at a time. All right, so that's sort of the background of Flyway. Any questions so far? Yeah. Uh, so the question is, so you have multiple people um, checking stuff in, and they might all check in the same version? Is that the question? But sure, that, that can be a problem. So what you do is um, somebody should notice that, and, and you can change, you know, you could change your one of them to 2.01 or something like that. Or, you know, it does take some communication. There's nothing wrong with, uh, as I'm later, later in the talk, there's nothing wrong with, um, if you're working on something that's not going to be in production for a long time, and you're currently at version 2 or something like that, 
there's nothing wrong with saying, all right, I know my stuff's not going to production for a long time. I'll make mine version five or six or 10 or something like that. Just skip a bunch of numbers so that you aren't constantly reordering yours to, to be later, to be, you know, to keep moving along. Was there another question? Same question? Okay. Does that, does that make sense? I mean, it does take some communication. There, there's no automatic way to, to resolve it because somebody needs to decide which one has to come first. Um, all right, so to, to apply a migration, um, you write your migration, you put it in the, in the right folder, um, and then fl you just run this command called flyway migrate. And it'll, uh, it searches for any migrations that have not yet been applied. And it, um, it'll run each migration in its own transaction. Uh, and then on a failure, it'll uh, roll back that, that transaction. And it'll, it'll quit with a, it'll quit with a um, non-zero exit status. So you'll actually get a genuine error. Um, that's helpful if, you're, if it's in a, a build script or something like that. Um, Yeah, so the question was, how does it determine the, the order? And it's the file name structure that, that, on that, that I did on that last slide, the, the, um, the version number of, of that. Uh, and this, this, this rollback feature works really well with Postgres. It doesn't work as well with, with some other data, databases, but with Postgres, because all of your DDL changes can be rolled back, um, you basically, it says, this migration did not get applied. Um, here's the error that, that Postgres sent back. Um, you know, with other databases, if, if you wrote a migration that won't actually run, that has an error in it, um, you'll be in some sort of indeterminate state because it will, it can't roll back all the DDL changes for you automatically. So it'll say, um, there's an error with this transaction, with this migration, but we can't entirely get rid of it. So it takes some manual work, but not with Postgres. So hooray Postgres. Um, basically what, what it's doing, um, so the first time you run migrate, it creates this table called schema version by default. It, you can change that too. Um, and it, so as I said, it's not magic, it's a pretty simple thing. Um, you might not be able to read all of that, but, but the basic idea is that it keeps this table and it has the versions and the, the order they were installed in and then who installed them, the username, <coughs> uh, when, and how long it took to do it, um, and was it successful or not. And so this is the way that, that Flyway keeps track of what it's done and what it needs to do. Um, yeah? You have uh, servers that are replicated, let's say unidirectional. Is this compatible with this kind of the proper commands so it can make it default? So the question is if, if you have servers that are replicated to, to somewhere else, um, it's just sending commands to, to the server um, using JDBC. So as long as you know any other DDL command would be replicated somewhere else, then it, it should be replicated just just fine to the to the downstream server. Yeah. Do you have subdirectories in the stable directory, or does everything have to be in one big file? Uh, so the question is, do you can you have subdirectories within that SQL directory? Um, I don't think so. I don't think you can have subdirectories there. I think it's just you'll end up with a big long list of files there. It would be nice, though. Yeah. Um, uh, so there are a couple of important options for the migrate. Uh, the URL, of course, how to, how to contact your server. Um, you can set a target, which is um, a very useful. So if, if you had well, the case, what we talked about before, where somebody had set their, you're on version two, you have version three uh, that wants to go to production, and then somebody has written version five or 10, that's, that's way out in the future. You can set a target to say, um, just go to version two. Don't keep going beyond that. Um, and then uh, there's another version which is, which is newly set to true by default, which is um, validate on migrate. So um, it's saying, I'm going to check all the other migrations that have already been applied and make sure that they haven't changed at all before I apply any new migrations. Uh, and so it, it checks the contents and the, the, the file name and all that stuff to make sure nothing has changed since, since you uh, applied that migration. So if you go in and someone makes a change in some old migration that's already in production, um, it'll complain. Uh, so, let's see. How would you, how would you resolve that? How would you resolve that? 
it's it's pretty easy. Well, and resolving it within Flyway is pretty easy. Uh, you know, you need to figure out why somebody made that change, of course. Um, but there there's a command called um, uh, I think it's called re repair, uh, which will say uh, I, I did mean to make that change, so to go ahead and fix that in the in the in the metadata table, in the schema version table. So it, it'll update the MD5 sum and the and the description and all that stuff. It won't yeah. actually rerun. The migration. It won't rerun re the migration. It'll say you know that that's sort of left up to you if if you actually did intend to to change something that was already applied. Change it by hand and then yeah. Yep. Uh, let's see. Okay, I wanted to try to do a quick demo here. So this is, I'm in the Flyway um, directory here. Uh, I have just a, a totally empty database. Uh, let's see. So in the SQL directory there, I have one migration. It Flyway comes with this uh, text file already that says put your SQL migrations here, dot text. Um, this migration just has, it's very, very simple, I think. Yeah, create, create this table. Um, so I can run flyway migrate here. Again, this is a totally empty database. So it's saying validated migration, because it had never been applied before, it didn't really matter. Um, and then it create, since it had never been run before, it had to create this um, schema version table. Um, and then it, it successfully applied this one migration. Uh, and this next command I'll, I'll talk about a little bit is called flyway info, which tells you where you're at. So right now we're saying, it's saying, okay, I've applied this um, word version one, and that it was successful when I applied it, um, and, and the description which came from that, from the file name. <coughs> Any questions? Yeah. Uh, it, yes. Yeah, it can be. In this case, I, I just have it set to trust, so it's not, there's no password. But, but um, uh, yeah, you can set the password in, in the config file. But do you want to update from the remote site? Yeah, if you want to update a remote site, yeah, you could set the password in there. Yes? Is there any feature to pick up the change once I, you know, added one column, but actually we don't need this column, so I don't want to resume the changes? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the question is, how, can you go back? So say the next the next migration was to add a column. Can you unadd that column? And some of the other um, migration tools do support that. I think that I think both the Rails one and the SQL Alchemy one both both support that that, that sort of version of, of downgrading. Flyway does not, and they they make a, a pretty convincing argument about why not. Because you um, you you can't know you can't always go backwards. And unless you're actually testing each time that you can go backwards, um, you can't always do it. So what I would do in that case is just write another migration to remove that, that thing that you just did. Let's say it's version three, oops, I, I didn't actually need that column, let's just delete that column. So then it, you know, it's a little extra overhead in your database creating a column and removing the column, but, but you sort of know where you are in the scheme of things. All right, let's see if I can get back to Yes. Which doesn't have all of those ingredients in it. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yes. The, so the question is, can you just sort of avoid, if you're doing a bunch of stuff and then you're sort of undoing a bunch of stuff, can you just sort of start from this later point that has um, some sort of known state in it? And eventually, you will always want to do this because eventually, you know, you'll end up with thousands of files in that table if you don't do this at some point. So at some point, you'll, you'll say, and I, I tend to do this whenever I'm, I'm upgrading a new major version in Postgres, um, I'll, I'll to say, okay, we have this whole schema there. Let's just dump all of that and turn that into version one, and then sort of wipe out the schema version table, and then start from there. Um, <coughs> okay. 
So the, the flyway info command is, is, I just ran that there, that shows you what, um, it prints out that little table of what migrations have been applied and what have not. Um, it shows if it was successful, yeah. So the question is, can you can you not run it inside of a transaction? Because um, there there are some like the the create index concurrently, which you can't run inside a transaction. And yeah, as far as I know, you I don't think that there's a way to not run it inside of a transaction, unfortunately. I mean, in a in a case like that, if you really need to get around it, you could. Um, you, know, you would you would basically do that by put in a migration that would that would uh, create an index for everybody else on their development boxes and stuff like that, and you would do that create index concurrently on your on your box, um, and then let's see what would you do, and then um, you, know, you would have to tell Flyway to, to skip that migration when it's when it's applying it to the production. Uh, yeah, so the really useful thing about um, Flyway Info is that you can use it as a test for, for remember I mentioned that dash target um, option for migrate to tell it to not go beyond a certain point, um, to not apply all migrations that are there. You can use this as a test and it'll, it'll show you, um, I, can, I can try to show you that. Let's see, let me get that back at the top. All right, so I think I have another migration here. Okay, so now I, I just put a new migration into um, the SQL folder. If I run info like that, so it'll say uh, this this one. It was just an alter table to users doesn't really matter, but it say this migration is is pending. What if I say well, uh, what do we say? So it'll say, so I, I wrote the target there. I gave it the target option thing. Um, the target is just 0001.00, which is just that first migration I did. So it'll say, this is greater than target, so don't worry about that. So it's a, it's a good way to test before you actually apply these migrations to production or, or even your development database. If you don't want to go beyond a certain version, um, you can test it with the info first and then run your migrate using that same target option there. Uh, and then this one, which I, I do expect some discussion about. So if you apply a migration, so say you're on, your, you're on your development database, you apply a migration, you say, uh, that migration isn't really right. Um, so one option is to write another migration which fixes that, that problem. The other op option is to start from scratch again. And um, you know, the number of ways to do that, you could just drop your database and, and recreate your database from scratch. Or um, Flyway has, has this um, command called clean which will um, try to drop all the objects in the schema that, uh, that it's that Flyway sort of controlling. Um, you should obviously never run this in production. Um, and uh, there's a, a schemas option um, to Flyway which tells it sort of what, what schemas it, it is managing. And when you run clean, it'll clean out all of the schemas that it's managing. Um, it used to miss some stuff in Postgres, like used, it used to miss, I think, user-defined types and stuff like that. It's gotten a little better. The problem is that it, it only handles um, sort of schema-wide things, not cluster-wide or database-wide things. So it doesn't really do well with um, extensions. Um, you, there are some workarounds to deal, to deal with extensions. Um, I, I posted a thing there. Um, but so there are some ways there, um, where you can get around it. But uh, uh, you know, I, I still tend to just drop the database and recreate it from scratch. Um, this one I, I showed you just a few seconds ago. Um, so validate is just what's run by default now when you try to migrate. It, it checks all the stuff that's already been run and make sure it hasn't changed. And repair is the thing that says, oh, I, 
I did actually mean to change it, so, so go ahead and update the, the metadata table. Uh, so that, that um, is basically, if you're starting from a totally empty database, which you know, not many people have that luxury, um, you can just start with version one and, and go from there. If you're starting with stuff in your database, which most of us are, um, it takes a bit more work, but I, I still think it's worth it. And basically what you do is um, sort of what I described earlier. Um, you create a base version from the existing production database where you dump out the entire schema, um, you dump out any um, reference data that you, you think all the developers will need, um, and then you sort of combine this, massage this into one base version, one big um, version one. Um, and then you run this command called flyway baseline on the production database, which will basically create that um, schema version table, that metadata table that Flyway uses. Um, and it also, you give it some options, so it knows what to call that first version, and it knows to skip that first version when it's actually, when, it, when you run Flyway Migrate for real on the production database. Um, and then you would write, you start your next, migra your next migration with version two, or whatever you want to call it. So that's, that's the basics of Flyway. There's, there's only six commands, most of which you don't really use. You mostly use um, migrate and info, or the, the meat of what, whatever you're gonna use. Um, are there any questions on Flyway? Ten thousand migrations. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So the question is, what if you have ten thousand migrations? Do you apply them every time? The answer is yes. If you if you really do have ten thousand migrations that you've created over years, or you know maybe you're really fast at writing migrations and you write them in, in whatever a year or something like that, then then yes, you would have it would basically start from zero and, and apply them all. At some point, you'll probably get tired of that, and you can, you can start with that schema you have, dump out that schema that you get at the end, or dump out whatever you have at the end of the schema and maybe some data that, that you put in all those migrations, and then um, wipe out all your other migrations and just set that schema as version one and start from there. Yeah, but you still need to somehow create that baseline right. schema that so contains that's everything you've applied in those other migrations at some point. Which is probably a good crack, you know, standard operating procedure. Yeah, at, at some point it, it takes, this, start, this stuff starts taking a long time to run um, as you're applying more and more migrations. Um, and, and it is good. And, and generally, as I said, I, I do that basically when, whenever we're upgrading Postgres major versions, I tend to do that just because we're doing a lot of stuff at that time anyway. Might as well do more. Um, uh, any other questions? Uh, so the question is, are this there a way to have branches? Um, oh, so 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 if you want to load test data for devs. Um, The, which flag? Oh yeah, out of order flag. Um, so if, if I were to load test data for devs, uh, well the way I, I currently do it um, is you have, you have some sort of thing that which loads test data. I don't know, if it could be a shell script, it could be you know, a psql command or something like that, um, which wouldn't really be a migration because um, it's not gonna eventually go into your, into your production database. Um, and what you do is, is you run 
flyaway with the target command. So, so you, you've sort of written this thing to work out a specific version of your schema. You run flyaway with the, with the target command to, to get your schema to that version. Then you run your data loading command or whatever. And then you want to flyaway migrate again with no target on it and it'll apply everything else. Um, so it's sort of, yeah, so I, I, that is a common thing where you're sort of loading up data um, for devs to use. And th I think that's, at least for me, that was, I found that was the best way to handle it, was to get yourself to a specific version that you've written your, your imp data importing script for, and then, and then apply some data. Yeah. You might not know this because you mentioned not having written Java migration, but if you did have a Java migration, it, I'm assuming the numbering syntax would be <coughs> run all the SQL until you get to it the same, like you version them the same. You version them the same. Order. Yep. Yeah. So Yeah, yeah. So, 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 yeah. The hint was you could use a Java migration, which would have a lot. It could have a lot more logic in it. Um, Flyway also has placeholders in there, which uh, you can uh, specify on the command line. You know, it, it would take some some creativity to, to use that. Uh, you know, you could you could put in a placeholder for for production or for um, dev or something like that, and it could you know sort of optionally do stuff. It, the the migrations would would know it would basically replace that, that um, string inside of your migrations there. What, what's the syntax of the replacement? Uh, I think it's just like, um, it's like placeholder dot, um, the name of the placeholder equals something like that, uh, equals the, the string. Yeah, that that is true. If, if I mean, if you can, if you have, if you can put your data in through your through your application, that's definitely a great way to, to do it. If you already have, you know, a certain ORM layer that can that can handle that stuff, and you're already modifying your ORM layer to deal with the, the database changes, then that's a great way to do it. Um, all right, so I just wanted to talk about um, good migrations and what what should be in them and what should uh, not be in them. Um, you, know, you can't put everything in migration. The vast majority of your data is not going to be in a migration. But what, what kind of changes do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the audience here, what kind of changes do you guys think should be in migration? There's some pretty obvious ones. DDL, DDL obviously. It's a big thing. What was that? Yeah, some, some reference table data, th data, you know, fairly small tables that you think everybody would, um, you know, all your, you'll need on all your different databases. Anything else? But sort of fill out a, a new column with, with data, yeah. All right, so I, I have a couple of things. So obviously, the, we said that all the DDL stuff, and it, it's really critical that it, that this this all is taken literally. You can't you can't be going um, you can't go into your production database and just change stuff there and expect migrations to still work when you apply them there. You know, all of your structural changes <laughs> need to be in in your migrations. Um, so everything you know, even creating indexes and stuff like that. You know, there are some some cases where you might have to carefully work around that, but but really. Um, all of your changes, it's sort of a business rule, a business practice that needs to be implemented that all of your changes would go into these migrations. Um, reference data, and then I, I put a little users and a little question mark there. Do you know what, what's the problem with dealing with users and permissions there in a migration? You might want to not want to give your dev users the production username and password. Yeah, yeah, that, that's very valid. You might not want to give your, your dev users 
everyone's password. Um, uh, so the other thing is, so Flyway works on schemas, but users are not schema specific, right? They're cluster specific. They're cluster wide, um, which takes a bit more sort of finesse when you're creating users. So if if you run Flyway clean, um, it won't remove any users because they aren't in a schema. They're in a cluster. Uh, so if you're trying to keep your users and your permissions in sync across all your different um, databases, which is, you know, probably don't want all of your users in there, but at least your application users or your application roles or something like that, you'd want to be able to assign them to different, um, you'd want to assign uh, permissions to your tables and things like that. Um, it's not a trivial, there's no trivial solution. Um, you know, here's one solution I sort of, we sort of came up with um, where I work where if you only have one database per cluster, it's a lot easier. Um, basically, you would, um, Flyway is this, this uh, concept of callbacks where you can sort of hook into um, different points in the lifecycle of the migration. Um, and I would say, and so you could say af after it runs a clean, go through and delete all the users. And then you would have a, one of your migrations would create all your users. One of your, probably your first migration would create all of your users. And then, uh, um, so, if you only have one database per cluster, it's a pretty good solution, unless you don't want to give all your passwords to all your devs. Um, uh, just some other tips that I've come across running migrations, and I'm sure there's lots of debate about this, but um, I like to keep them small so you can go and read them. Obviously, that first version one is going to be huge because it's all of your schema, but if you're writing your your uh, your upgrades. Um, I like to keep them small, and I like to break things up. Use use the um, the minor versions there to break up a, a bigger migration into smaller things. You need know, to write your create your tables in one migration, create your views and functions and whatever. Break them all up into different migrations. It's not you don't have to do that. There's no reason you have to do that, but I kind of like to do that. As I said earlier, feel free to skip some numbers if your stuff's not going to go into production for a while. Uh, so I got a couple minutes uh, to talk about Jenkins. Um, have people used Jenkins here before? Okay, good. Um, so it, as it, it's widely used, even in this room. Um, it's used a lot for automating builds um, and for automating continuous integration tests. So it's basically just a, a server that sits there and you configure it to, to build a project or something like that. Um, and generally the way it runs is it's, it can either set it to build a project on a certain schedule or build something whenever, so it, whenever your, the source code changes. Um, which is probably more frequently how it's run. Um, and so uh, if you're setting up Jenkins product to work with Flyway, um, if you're using Flyway along with developing your software, basically you'd set Jenkins up to watch both your Flyway directory and your software directories for any um, changes. And it checks, you know, you can, ch you can tell it how often to check and things like that. Um, I like to use it with a separate whole separate cluster per Jenkins project, that's certainly not, uh, it's not necessary, but I think it just makes it a little easier. Um, and I, I also like to create a project that, um, sort of an additional project beyond all your software projects, that basically just looks at um, the Flyway directory and just runs that, um, just runs the, the Flyway, probably a clean, then a migrate whenever anything is checked in. That way, if somebody checks in something that doesn't work, um, it'll fail immediately. And if it does work, then it can trigger the downstream builds, which will actually do something more complex and run some tests and things <coughs> like that. But I like to just have one that'll just make sure that it runs. Um, I like to have my projects parameterized in Jenkins, which is just an option right at the, the top of the huge list of options in Jenkins. And I give it um, sort of the, the DB host and database port and the database name. Um, and then if you just have a really simple database and you can use the Flyway Clean, um, basically you can start out creating your database just like this. You would just say run Flyway. The, the workspace is a variable that you get with Jenkins. Um, it's where it checked out all your code to. So run Flyway, give it the URL, um, the DB host, DB port, DB name, then just run clean and migrate. And that'll clean out whatever was there already. and then migrate you up to the latest version. Assuming that you're only maintaining this as the Jenkins and the dead library came first, rather than the last time it changed, you should be in that state anyway? 
Uh, yeah, so the question is, is assuming that, that um, your migrations aren't changing, why would, why would you need to clean first? But, but the thing is, your migrations can change. If, if I'm de actively developing software, I'll, I'll have um, your, your migrations, which has not have been applied to production, can change. So if I'm actively developing software, I'll be you know, actively developing my changes to the database. And I'll have a migration that I think will work. And then you know, the next day, like, uh, I should have done, you know, done 80 varchar instead of 40 varchar, something silly like that. Um, and that can change the migration. And there's no way to go backwards in the migration. So basically, you run the clean and start, and it builds it from scratch. Um, instead of running the clean, you can um, use the Postgres tools so you can drop your database and um, you know, maybe reset your users and create a new database and things like that. Um, and this is what I talked about a little bit earlier. If you, need to, uh, if you need to load data, you can run with a specific target, and then you would load, load your data with your script if you, are, if you can't um, load it with your application. And then you could run the, the last migrate here without a target just to get, just to apply all the rest of the migration. All right, so this is just to summarize, um, I think migrations are a great tool for keeping all your databases in sync. It's, a, it's also a really great way to show the current state of the database. You get a version that your database is at, and you know exactly what changes have been applied to your database. Um, it allows you to test your database changes, because they can go um, straight into your, your automatic builds and things like that. Um, I think Flyway is, is a great migration tool. It's certainly not the only one out there. It's the one I know best, and it's the one that I would recommend. But um, I'm not, I'm not uh, particularly tied to it somehow. Um, and it, it's, it's a pretty simple tool. Basically, all it's doing is applying the, the migrations in a specific order. Um, and it can do a few other things, but that's, that's the meat of it. I mean, probably most of the people who could write here could write something pretty similar, but um, Flyway does it well. Uh, and you can also use Flyway to, with Jenkins together um, to run when any, when any schema change is checked in. And just a final reminder that all of your structural changes must be in a migration. It just it, the, the whole concept breaks down if you start just adding stuff or changing stuff in production without putting it in a migration first. All right, any questions? Yes. What, I'm sorry, what? If we have databases that are already out of sync, then we can hot fix things without, without a migration to get them. If you just have something weird in one database, that would be an exception to the everything has to be. Right? <laughs> we don't ever want to do that because none of the other, like any properly built database doesn't even have that. <laughs> OK. Yeah, so if something's already out of sync, then you're kind of already away from the migration trail anyway. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there you go. Drop it and start over. <laughs> so it, it'll, uh, so the, uh, let me see. So there's, it'll check the, my, the, basically the text of the migrations that, that are in that SQL folder or the Java folder. But it won't, it won't go out to your schema and try to check anything there. Um, you know, it'll make sure that, that those text files or Java files or whatever have not changed at all. But that's, that's, that's all the validation it'll really do. Yeah. Um, so can you use callbacks as part of migrate to eventually load uh, data? Yeah, so the question is, could you run callbacks as part of migrate to, to potentially load data? And I'm sure you could. Um, you know, the, there are callbacks all over the, that migration cycle. Where you can run before clean, after clean, before migrate, after migrate, after each migration, and things like that. So if you had like a development environment, you could add that as part of the command line for refreshing the development environment, but it would have nothing to do with you know updating the other environment. Yeah. Well, somehow you'd have to tell it to not run in production. I'm not sure exactly how to do that, but but uh, yeah, you know, I'm sure I'm sure you could figure it out somehow. You just tell all your developers drop this after. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we're kind of out of time. Thank you all. If you uh, feel free to ask me more questions up up here, but um, thank you. Thank you.